We have here an emulator for the Cambridge EDSAC. It is a lot more user-friendly on this screen than it would have been initially when, remember, you are dealing with five-hole paper tape. That's what your program went in on. Your answers came back out on five-hole paper tape, which it was your job to put through a teleprinter machine, which chattered away, read your tape and printed out the answers. Fortunately, we have the printed out answers shown in front of us. Here is the standard display of this uh, emulator. So handily written by our friend Martin Campbell Kelly from the University of Warwick. You can download this for yourself. It's free to use and just play with it to your heart's content. And it's very nice to have the opportunity to play with a really genuine early first generation computer. We've been talking about John von Neumann or Johnny von Neumann. Call me Johnny. Yes. Call me Johnny. So EDSAC is being built in Cambridge, but how does it end up getting connected to von Neumann? Is that where we're going? Yes, that's right. It's, it's the other way around, of course, that the, uh, the person who built EDSAC, Morris Wilkes, exact contemporary Alan Turing, both got first class degrees in mathematics. He was the one, Morris Wilkes, who went to John von Neumann's summer school in 1946 at the University of Pennsylvania, the Moore School of Engineering. Poor old Morris had such difficulties with raising the money, with getting his passport straight, and all sorts of other issues that he actually arrived four weeks late for a six-week course. One has to remember, of course, in those days it was not straightforward. You were talking about ships, you know, going via Iceland and heaven knows where and train journeys to finish off down to Pennsylvania. But anyway, I think he must have had what was the technology, Roneoed or cyclostyled notes when he got there. He, he got copies of the notes and was able to follow exactly what was going on, learnt about the, von Neu the proposed von Neumann architecture, knew that there was going to be this thing called EDVAC being built in Pennsylvania, and he and all the other participants were more or less, I think, invited to go off, do your own thing, support the cause of general purpose, binary-based uh, digital computers, all electronic, not electromechanical, for the inner electronics. And in fact, it's worth saying something about um, this whole business about what did it cost you to be all electronic in those days. I would remind you that Tommy Flower's decision with Max Newman to build Colossus out of thermionic valve, that's vacuum tubes for those of you still in North America, it did cost you. Yes, you could switch them on and switch them off. You could use them as logic elements. But Boy, did they consume electricity. And, and then, of course, you had to have air conditioning to get rid of the heat that they'd produced. Um, all the time, what held things up was you, you wanted to use them as switching elements, but you really paid the price in terms of power consumption. So, Tommy Flowers and his uh, special purpose Colossus machine, six kilowatts. EDSAC, now being rebuilt in Cambridge, uh, the EDSAC rebuild should go live this coming summer, 2018. Watch out for that. Good time to visit the National Museum of Computing, which is co-located on the Bletchley Park site. Power consumption of EDSAC? 11 kilowatts. For comparison, power consumption of ENIAC, the Gunnery Trajectory Special Purpose Computer, 1946, University of Pennsylvania, USA. I bet you can't remember the number, Sean. It's horrifying. 20? 150 kilowatts. All of that using thermionic valves for the logic uh, elements inside your computer. Yes, that could certainly be done. The big problem was memory. There was really no obvious technology for memory. You get round it on the Colossus machine by saying, well, your data, which you want to remember, just cycles round on a continuous loop. The program, well, that's easy. That's not on tape because that is it's so, such a special purpose machine. You key in the program on switches, uniselectors. So your memory there for your data was paper tape. But if you didn't want paper tape whizzing around at 30 miles an hour, what other options were available to you? And the answer is not many. And as we'll find out on EDSAC, with Morris Wilkes coming out of a radar background, he knew that in the early days of radar, 
when pulses came along, and these are interesting pulses, could it be an approaching German bomber, you wanted to not only get hold of the pulse, but to hang on to it and remember it so you could analyse its shape and so on. And the way they did that is the most amazing technology, it's called mercury delay lines. The bleep pulse that you get was put basically through a little loudspeaker, so it went bleep. But instead of transmitting through air so that you could hear it, it was transmitted down a column of mercury. Why? Because sound travels a lot slower in mercury than it does in air. And at the other end, there was a microphone at the other end of your tube, which heard the bleep and displayed it on an oscilloscope screen for you, but then recycled it. It took it back to the start of the mercury tube and sent it down again. So you had a continuously circulating system that showed you what your pulses were. And the idea was to use that same technology to represent the zeros and ones in computer memory, which they did. It was not very satisfactory in so many ways, but you just had to do your best. Presumably it deteriorated, didn't it, the sound or...? No, because when you, when you detected it at the other end, you amplified it before you fed it back again. So you could keep the purity of the pulse going for as long as you wanted to. That was the idea. So the story continues. Um, Morris Wilkes came back to England and in a testament really to Cambridge's being fairly well healed and to their faith in Morris and to their need to be at the forefront of all this stuff, they, by they I mean the university and the mathematics department at Cambridge, agreed to bankroll Morris to build one of these newfangled machines, provided that when it was completed it could offer a service to the university. This is very different to what happened in most of the universities where electronics engineers were just allowed to build systems where you just played with them and didn't really offer a computing service to the community at all. They were just pure research machines. Morris found himself a very good hardware engineer called Bill Rennick, who was just excellent. You had to have this. You had to have a real devoted electronics engineer who knew what they were doing to get all of this working. When you look at it, you've got this box, it's hardware, you've got to get it working. You've got to get instructions in it, you've got to make it work. But you need a software person, and you need the world's first ever system software person, and they'd better be good. Somehow these people seem to come along, as and when they're needed. I've never understand quite why, and the answer at Cambridge was a, a really talented person, who I did know, but rather slightly, called David, David Wheeler. We can now say that as part of the celebrations this summer, when the EDSAC rebuild is switched on and works perfectly. To go along with that, a very good friend of ours on Computerfile, Professor Martin Campbell Kelly, developed an emulation of EDSAC and how it works. So rather than talking in abstract about EDSAC, let's get stuck in and run some programs on EDSAC and see what you're up against with a very genuine first generation machine where you will program in the crudest and most brain damaging form of assembly you can imagine and you've got to get it right. It is not easy to debug EDSAC programs, it can be done, but you know, it's hardcore stuff. You want to be a pioneer? This is what you get. I think what I'll do is first of all just for fun let's run some programs and get the feeling for how nice it is to be able to mess about even on a very early machine like that. For those of you interested afterwards what is of great computer science technical interest is how on earth do you boot this thing up so it can read in your program. In other words it's not going to BIOS, it's far too early for that. But what was the equivalent of the BIOS? What was it that got you started that you had to have there, even to be able to read in a paper tape? Well, that's called initial orders. We'll do those later. For the moment, we'll just accept that initial orders version 2 is the one that uh, is relevant here. And I've used initial orders to load in a program that was written, written by an early pioneer called Sandy Douglas. Here's his name, A.S. Douglas. If I load in that program now by start. Here, and this really is EDSAC, but this was an oscilloscope screen. 
This is the so-called display of the long tank, with a long tank of mercury, which held roughly a killer word. 1,024 18-bit memory words were held in mercury. So it's like 1K words, two, a few K bytes, that was your limit. OK, so when you got used to reading these oscilloscope screens, and remember, this oscilloscope screen is not the memory itself. It's peeping at the memory by having a little monitor, as it were, checking the pulses in the mercury tank and displaying them on the oscilloscope. And remember and give thanks for the fact that this loading please wait, EDSAC user first dial, now comes back at you, courtesy of Martin, in a clearly visible screen. In the good old days, it'd probably come back to you on paper tape or something, and you would have to go and print it off to get your results. But this is pretty well interactive. On this dial here, on the console, do we want EDSAC to go first or user to go first? Well, so, the game we're playing here is the one known in the US and elsewhere as Tic-Tac-Toe, known in the UK as Noughts and Crosses. But um, it's simple. I think everybody knows the rules, and I think everybody pretty well knows that if you play optimally, it's always a draw. I have a feeling there's a number file on it somewhere. There must be a number file on it somewhere. Yes, you can always force a draw. So shall we do, first of all, we'll take the lead and force a draw. So EDSEC or user first? Well, we'll say user first, so I dial one. Now let's what, see what happens. Oh, look at that. The cathode ray tube display has been altered by the program to actually show the grid that we're going to play tic-tac-toe on. And because it's me, the user first, it's now saying to me, dial my move. Now, here's the key at the top lock, 987 Those are the areas on the tic-tac-toe board. And as we all know, I think optimal strategy is to grab the center one, first of all. Yeah. And EDSAC's responded by putting a naught in at the top left. I'm going to respond by 987. I'm going to dial in seven. Yeah. Now, I should, you think, that's a slow response. Was EDSAC really that slow? <laughs> that is six times faster than EDSAC was. I've calibrated it. This emulator on this machine seems terribly slow, but it's running six times faster than EDSAC did. Right at the very end, I may allow myself, if you want to be shocked and horrified, to click the thing up here that says real time. That will slow it down so that it really is as slow as EDSAC was. Well, wh why don't we do that now? Let's do that after, now. After you make your move, let's see how slowly it... Would there have been one of those dials? That looks like an old telephone dial. It is an old telephone dial. And dials? I think that was there for diagnostic purposes on the actual EDSAC, yes. Let's We're trying see. to win this, aren't we? Um, well, no, it's F6, isn't it? I put an X in there, yeah, yeah. otherwise oh, the wretched seven. machine's going to win. Was that slower? Oh, yeah. I think it was. Ah, but look, it's blocked me there. It's doing the right thing. So I put in an X at 8. There we go. It's definitely slower. Definitely slower. And good old Sandy's program has already told me it's a drawn game. So let's load up from the library. Ah, Conway, okay. okay? Well, I think we all know about Conway's game of life. There are these sets of dots and there are various rules about a dot in the middle either being overcrowded with too many dots around it um, or uh, getting all lonely and out on a limb and dying off. But in the middle, if it's just got the right number of friends, then they breed and they spawn off more things. It was a very popular invention by John Conway. In it. Was it the 70s or the 80s? Somewhere around there. And everybody was playing life using pencil and paper methods or using computers, latterly, of course. Now, this was not written, actually, at the time of Ed Sachs uh, unveiling in 1949 because life hadn't been invented. But somebody later, later on with this uh, simulator in, in mind and in view has actually written Conway's Life to display here for us. So let us load this thing in. It's by Ian Gilman, written in 1998. And the rule is on this uh, emulator, for those of you that download it, the program you are displaying is the one that will get loaded and run when you press start. So just keep your program windows in the correct order, one on top of another, and the one at the top is the one that will load. So we'll load it up with start. It takes quite a while to load it in because it's quite a complicated program. 
Ah, now, it started calculating now. This is the initial configuration. It warns you here, each generation takes about five EDSAC minutes. Now, I have not put it onto real EDSAC slow time. I've put it on six times faster simulator time. Again, all according to Conway's rules, it will... Uh, look, it's gone, it's changed. New generation. So I think my rule is about right. It is roughly five to six times faster here because it's taking around about a minute. I just daren't put it onto real time as so because... Well, we'd run out of tape. We'd run out of tape. But anyway... So I can see a clock on the right that looks like it's going a bit fast. Is that...? I think that's trying to show you genuine EDSAC time. So if on this simulator it's five or six times faster than real EDSAC would be, it's therefore making the clock go five or six times faster, I think, to show you how many elapsed minutes it would have taken on EDSAC. Down at the bottom there, I can see a lot of flickering and flashing. That's all the calculation. That's all the calculation. This is showing, you see, look, you've got a multiplier register in your CPU. You've got the thing you're multiplying by, you've got the answer which comes out in the accumulator. Even modern chips have an accumulator for your current arithmetical answer, right? The SCT here is showing you the address of the current instruction and the actual bit pattern for the current instruction that has been decoded and executed is shown in the so-called order tank. So that's the instruction register. That's the pointer telling you where from memory you've taken that instruction. And it's a pretty minimal CPU. The thing we notice here is there are virtually no general purpose registers, which is what you get in a modern CPU. So I think that's a, a pretty good one, actually, to uh, illustrate with. We can stop it off now. So I hope this has convinced a fair number of you, particularly those of you very keen on history of computing and low-level programming in general, that it's a testament really to the very Spartan architecture of EDSAC, you know, cut everything down to the bare minimum, get it working, it's got to give a service. And that means that it has stood the test of time. It's worth rebuilding. People could find it easy, relatively easy to do a good emulator for it. And that, in a sense, has made it worthwhile to rebuild at Bletchley Park. So you can be part of this. Get hold of Martin's emulator, enjoy yourself, write ultra low level programs for um, for EDSAC. Oh, and remember when you're doing it that uh, the actual pseudo tape you type up in the end, although on these program listings, you're allowed to put comments on because you're a weak human who needs to remind yourself of why you're doing that. When you actually key in the tape itself that backs this up, there must be no comments, no extraneous characters, only white spaces permitted. So there you are. Anyway, enjoy yourselves. And the next video is basically saying, how do, on earth do we get this thing to boot? <laughs> That is the von Neumann architecture, and it's very, very similar today. There was a big debate at the time about that store, that memory. Shouldn't you, for safety's sake...